Thank you for tuning in to the Bethel Temple Faith Church broadcast. We appreciate your viewership and are confident that there's a word from the Lord for you. Now with today's message, our pastor and founder, Pastor Bertram Hinton Jr. Amen. <clears throat> Let's get our Bibles, please, this morning. And if you could get those and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18 will be the central theme of where we come from today. I'm going to visit some other scriptures from here, but for a text, for those of you that want to be uh, scholarly today, you say your text is in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 17 and 18. I'll read the text. I'll give you my title. I will pray. Then we will proceed with the preaching and teaching moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. If you have that, would you simply say amen? Amen. Wonderful. The word of the Lord says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, <clears throat> but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. <laughs> Today, with the help of the Lord, I want to minister to us from this thought, battling the unseen. Amen. Battling the <coughs> unseen. Battling, fighting, if you will, the unseen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for this time that you've given us already to spend in your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher, who is the reminder of all things whatsoever Jesus has said. Father, we thank you now that your word is already perfect in and of itself. The scripture declares that it is the entrance of your word that giveth light. It gives understanding unto the simple. So we thank you today that your word will be illuminated in our lives, that understanding would be our portion, and that your will would be done during this time. I sit myself down now, and I ask the Holy Spirit to stand up tall on the inside of me, that you would preach through me, that you would teach through me, that you would give these your waiting people everything that they need to hear that is pertinent to their now situation. We thank you for revelation on today, and we thank you, God, for the clarity that comes from your spirit. Thank you for supernatural recall of your word that you would bring back to my mind every thought, every illustration, every example, every scripture necessary to get across this point today. Father, we never will steal any glory from you for all of it is yours already. We thank you now for what has already been spoken and what shall be decreed in the presence of these your people today. Have your way that your will would be done in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Battling the unseen. Many times um, in life we hear uh, Sister Jeannie and even we've been guilty of saying this one phrase that pastors get ready to say we've been guilty of saying if it isn't one thing it's another. We've been guilty of making those kind of proclamations over our present and our future that we oftentimes just could speak more on ourselves than what God intended for us to go through. We oftentimes put more weight and more pressure on our life by making that simple declaration that if it isn't one thing, it is another. Yes, uh, the reality is, Brashel, even though we are in the midst of uh, times that we live in that require us to press and to push and times that require us to fight. Many times, the things that we are fighting, Deacon Wells, are things that we cannot see. The truth of the matter is, oftentimes, the source of our issue is normally something that we cannot touch, see, or feel. Uh, when sickness comes, that is something literally that is not seen. You, you cannot see the cough. Uh, you cannot see the headache. You cannot see the pain, but it is something that you feel. Uh, when we're going through in our marriages, you cannot necessarily see what the core issue is. You might see the image of the person and think the person is where the struggle is, but many times what we're battling literally is not seen. 
Paul gives us a prescription today that I'm going to attempt to follow uh, where he tells us, Ma, that really what we ought to learn how to do is to stop looking at what we can see and learn how to fight the thing that we cannot see. Because it is what you cannot see, Sister Shell, that oftentimes gives you the most grief. Uh, it is what you cannot see, what you cannot put your finger on, what you cannot seem to figure out is the thing that normally causes you the greatest stress. But here it is. How, pastor, do I fight something that is not physical? How do I fight? How do I battle? How do I war? Sister Grid number three, when the thing is not visible. We've been taught, uh, even if you grew up in any kind of house, uh, one of the things that you would normally be taught in a household would be that even though you're not to be a bully, you still should not be bullied. Okay. Uh, you, you should not be a fighter, uh, but you should be able to, of course, defend yourself. So, so the reality wow. is, Brother Stooks, we'll learn, we've learned how to physically fight. But we have no clue on how to spiritually fight. Uh, we, we, we've learned, you know, we, we'll talk about these hands anytime. We, we'll talk about what we can do with these hands, Sister Tiana. But what can we do when the hands don't work? Oh, that's good, sir. How do we battle, Brother Evans, when my enemy is not, a, not an opponent that I can literally put my hands on, but my enemy is something that I cannot see? Yes, yes. All right. Paul began to say, I'm trying, Deacon. Paul began to say, I need you all to understand, church, uh, that really our weight should be on the unseen. Catch this, Ma, because the unseen is the thing that will always be. Okay. Uh, a trouble that might come visit your finances, that's periodic. You know, get another job and you, you know, finance trouble goes away. Uh, things that might visit your marriage, find out how to love your spouse all over again, that'll go away. But it is the thing that is not seen, mama, uh, that literally will be eternal. Pastor, what are you telling me? I'm telling you there will always be spiritual warfare, no matter how well or how good of a person you are, there will always be spiritual warfare until you meet Jesus. So Paul says, I need you to get a clue that the fighting is not going to do you any good in the natural. I need you to learn how to fight in the spirit because the spirit is where the eternal battle will always be. Your mind will always be in a place of battle because the enemy is really trying to get what God has already promised you to have. He's trying to steal the peace from you. I talked about that last week. He's trying to steal the peace from you that God says, I want to be eternal. So the enemy understands that his eternity is already damnation. So he wants yours to look just like his. We got to learn how to battle the unseen. The word unseen, I, I feel God already did it. The word, the word unseen, the word unseen is defined, Minister Black, even in a regular definition by Collins Dictionary today. Collins Dictionary defines unseen as something that you were not prepared for in advance. Unseen, Sister Lucky, is the thing that you had not prepared for in advance. Sister Akasha, there will be issues that will arise in your life as a young 26-year-old woman that literally you have not or will not be prepared to handle. There will be curveballs that will throw, be thrown at you in your walk with Christ that literally, Sister Fisher, you have not been prepared for in advance. People can tell you until they're blue in the face what they think marriage looks like, but you will never know what marriage looks like until you are in it. The reality is people can tell you what parenting is while you're pregnant. They can give you all kind of remedy and anecdote and things that you should be doing as it relates to bringing this baby in the world. But the truth of the matter is it is not until you're in that position that you know what that thing really is. Pastor, what are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to tell you is stop listening to people when they're trying to tell you how to get over something because it's only your experience with God that's going to get you through the unseen issue. Uh, I, I, I'm going to try to walk this thing today uh, with the help of the Lord. I thank y'all for giving me up enough time that I can take my time in doing it. 
Uh, the three points, I'm going to give you three points uh, so that Brother Wright can feel at home. He'll catch that on his way out. Uh, the three points that I'm going to give you today, our uh, first point in battling the unseen is I first have to identify the witness. <laughs> I got to identify the witness. All this is connected to the unseen. Okay, every point I'm giving you is connected to the unseen. So the first thing is I've got to learn how to identify the witness when I'm battling the unseen thing. There's a story in the book of Job uh, where, in fact, in the first chapter, the first two chapters, it tells us uh, that Job was perfect and an upright man. He he eschewed or he hated evil. All he did was that which was right in the sight of the Lord. The Bible says that Job, Job had you know plenty of money. He had plenty of cattle. He had a large family. He was successful in all the things that he was doing. And the Bible says that, you know, God was having a board meeting one day. Uh, and the enemy decided, Satan decided that he was going to show up at the angelic board meeting. And uh, when, when Satan comes up, God looks at him and says, well, what are you doing here? He says, well, uh, I'm coming to give you my report. Uh, you, 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 you know, there, there are committees that are reporting to you about the good that they're doing. I'm coming to give you my report. I've been going up and down, uh, looking to and fro, trying to see who I can, you know, get in there and bother. And God says to, 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 to Satan, he says, well, since you're going to be a part of the heavenly committee today, I'm going to give you a divine assignment. Catch where pastor's going. He gave the enemy evangelist Graham a divine assignment uh, to get him, the enemy, to see what was already inside of Job. The Bible says that God tells Satan, he says, have you considered, as you were going back and forth, have you considered Job because he's perfect? He will not fall. Have you considered uh, trying him what I identified, before I even talk about the witness, what I learned from that evangelist brand was this. God has a way of protecting the unprepared by trying the prepared. Okay, let, let, me, let me make sure you catch that one today. He has a way of protecting the unprepared by trying those who are prepared. What that means is, Sister Sivanese, I've learned how to be thankful that God could consider my name to be offered to the enemy. Because what he's saying is, I'm, I'm prepared to handle whatever the devil can throw at me. And there may be some in my circle that can't quite handle that kind of struggle yet. So he said, because I need somebody that I know won't throw in the Towel when things get hard. Have you considered my servant Hinton? Have you considered my servant Black? Have you considered my servant Jenkins? Because I understand that when folk tell him to quit, he's still going to keep going because I know he can trust me. So the Bible says that when the enemy realized that God had given Job, uh, uh, that, that God had given him some freedom, he began uh, to try to state his claim. He says, well, Lord, of course, Job will serve you. You've got a hedge of protection around him. You, you're blessing everything that he's doing. All he's doing, Evans, is prospering. Every time he gets a job, he gets promoted. Every time he buys a field, it starts being productive. Of course, he's going to bless you. Of course, he's going to worship you. Everything you do for him, you do good. God says, well, check this out. I'll lift the hedge. The only thing you cannot do is you can't touch his person. And so the Bible says that the enemy leaves Sister Shell excited because he's getting ready to take down one of God's chief men. And the Bible says that when the enemy comes and he hits these areas of Job's life, the Bible says something that is a lasting refrain in four verses. It says that there was always a witness that would come and say, but I was the only yeah, one that only escaped. Yeah. All right, Pastor, what, what, what are you trying to tell me here? Whenever I'm trying to battle the unseen, I've got to be able to identify the victory I'm looking for in another person. That way I know God is going to do it for me. See, I get excited. I'm kind of weird, Deacon Wells, because I know I got a building before the Lord in prayer. So what I've started doing, uh, Brush Shell, is I've identified certain pastoral friends of mine, and I've seen that God has opened some doors. I had one brother that walked around his new church, and he was videotaping what was going on, and another brother that was walking around videotaping what was going on. I said, God, I hear you loud and clear. I understand that it's only opposition to try to stop me, but the enemy is too stupid to realize I'm thankful for the witness that I see has already happened. I see that there is one that got what I'm trying to get. So I understand that this is still my season to attain it. I just got to be willing to fight through the opposition that's coming my way. 
The Bible says that when Job would hear that he, that they were the only one that was escaped, that he was the only one that was escaped, the Bible says that Job, even in the midst of that, still had a praise in his heart. I don't know if we really caught that. Uh, first lady, what, what that meant was he didn't look at the trial or as the obstacle as being a defeat. He was able to identify the good because I think the scripture is still in the book that says that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the call according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. So the reality is that it's a black. There always is going to be something good working even when there was bad that just happened. The Bible says that after all this, Job still has a worship experience and he still has a connection with God. And the enemy decides he's going to go interrupt next month's board meeting. And when he goes to the next month's board meeting and God says, well, what are you doing? He says, I've still been going up and down. You know, I've still been looking, see who I could trip up. And God says, well, listen, I thought we just showed you uh, that Job, you know, was willing to do it. And the enemy begins to say, man, grand. well, uh, of course, he's still going to bless you. Of course, he's still going to praise you uh, because he's got his health. Ah, oh, I'm, I'm trying to come pick somebody up. I hope we can hear beyond the text today. He said, of course, uh, he can still bless you even though his children are dead. And even though his field has been destroyed. And even though his wealth has been departed. And even though his finance is all on the rocks right now. Uh, of course, he's still going to praise you because he's got breath. He's still got life. And God says, well, check this, Satan. I'll even allow you now to touch his body. You just can't kill him. Just caught that. God says, the next level of challenge is when the challenge hits your body. It's easy to replace money. It's easy to even replace relationships, but it's hard when you can't get your health in line, when, when your breathing isn't right, and when your blood count is high, and when your sugar is elevated, and, and when cancer tries to visit you. It's difficult to praise God. And the enemy said, I realize if I can simply touch his body, I promise you that he'll curse you and die. If I can touch her throat, I promise you she won't get up and sing on Sunday. If I can touch their body, they'll stay at home. They won't push their way. But God says, go ahead and touch their body, but you can't take their life. And there's somebody in this room today that their body has been touched by the enemy. That the enemy has tried to disrupt some stuff in their physical. And you look the devil in his face and said, even though you tried to take me out, I'll still give God praise. Even though you tried to shut me up, I'll still worship the name of the Lord. Even though you tried to attack my mind, I'll still bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my heart. Job began to look, please be seated, y'all push me fast and I want to go. Job began to look around the stirs, and the man of God began to realize his whole body now was covered in boils. His whole body, don't worry about the first lady, his whole body was covered in boils. And the Bible says that what Job had to do from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet, he had to scrape the boils off of his body. And the Bible says in the midst of all that he still did not charge God foolish. That meant that even though it looked like God literally had quit on him and had given up on him, he still had a thank you in the middle of it. He said, God, I'll thank you even if I've got to sit on my own ashes, if I've got to sit on my own pain, if I've got to sit on my own difficulty, I'll still bless you. If I can't lift my hand, at least my mouth can still work. If my hands and my mouth don't work, at least my feet still move. If my hand, my mouth, and my feet don't work, at least my mind can still think of the goodness of the Lord. So it does not matter what the enemy tries to do to me. He cannot just the cook steal my praise. All that is connected to identifying the witness. Job, when he identified the witness, he began to understand that what he was battling was not something physical, Deacon Wells, but what he was battling was something that was unseen. It was something that he was not prepared for. Pastor, how can you tell me that? Well, when you read the text in Job, he said, the very thing that I feared has come upon me, which means in all my prayers, I would always say, God, don't let this happen. God, don't let that happen and the thing that he prayed not to happen is the thing that happened oh. catch this because Job had gained 
in such a dependency and a confidence in God, he believed that whatever he asked God to do, God was going to do it. And because his refrain had been not to allow this thing to happen, he never prepared for it because he believed God was going to answer it. And God says, sometimes your greatest challenge is going to be the thing that you have not prepared for. You didn't prepare to get that report from the doctor. You didn't prepare to get that report even concerning a family member. But God says, it is in that very thing that there's still a witness waiting for you. There's still somebody that's going to be able to testify that God has done this for them. Therefore, he can do it for you. As I continue to round the corner after I've identified the witness, the next thing I've got to do in battling the unseen minister black is I've got to recognize that the attack is never on my vision but always on my victory. The attack is never on my vision, but always on my victory. The attack, I've got to recognize this. When there's an unseen thing that I'm battling, after I've identified the witness in another, I now have to recognize that the attack has nothing to do with, with what God has already shown me, but it's got everything to do with me rejoicing in the victory. There's another story in Genesis chapter 49 that tells us about a man by the name of Jacob. Jacob, in fact, whose name was changed to Israel after a war and a battle with an angelic being, he now is at a point where he's getting ready to die. And he calls his 12 sons before him, Evangelist Graham, and when he calls his 12 sons before him, he begins to declare a blessing over each of their lives because he understands as a father there was an anointing on him to if he could bless no one else, he could at least bless his own children. Maybe y'all will catch that with next week. Fathers, that there's an anointing on you that if you can do good for nobody else. You at least can do good for your own children. You've got power in your mouth, Brush Stoops, to curse the fever that is bothering Samir. Even if pastor never lays hands on him, God says, well, it was in you. Oh, you catch that one too. It was in you that what you birthed in the earth, you've got power to declare that thing. All right, all right. So, so we got to recognize that it's the one I vision. The Bible, when Jacob is blessing his 12 sons, he gets to his favorite son, Joseph. And as as he's beginning to proclaim victory and blessing over Joseph, he tells Joseph, you are a fruitful bow. Even a fruitful bough that extends over the wall. He says the archers have have surely have sorely shot at you, but you have prevailed over them all. He says that God is going to bless you with a blessing above that which He gave to Abraham, Isaac, and even myself, because you were willing to go through the separation of what happened between you and your brothers. Pastor, what are you trying to tell me? You told me that the attack is never on my vision. Well, Ma, what I've identified is when. Jesus Jacob was declaring this blessing over Joseph's life, the attack on his vision had already taken place. That's right. His vision was that he had a dream, Sister Fisher, that his, his brothers and his parents would one day be worshiping or kneeling down to him, that he would be a type of ruler over them. And that thing was fulfilled about 20 years before what Jacob was saying. So I begin to think, Sister Sivanese, why is it necessary that in the blessing process, God still speaks about why I went through what I went through if I already got over it? Here, this is what he told me. He told me, he said, Ma, he said, because many times in life just because our attack has ended does not mean we have gotten over it. Amen. There are people who did you wrong that have been dead for 30 years, but their wrong still bothers you. Even though the attack has ended, there still is a grip that they have over you. And God says, before I can bless you with victory, you've got to be able to realize that the attack they put on your vision no longer has power over you. Pastor, what are you trying to tell me? There's a vision that you've got for your life. There's a vision that I have for this church. There's a vision that you ought to have for your own personal well-being. And many times that vision comes under attack. Sister Keaston, they're always will seem like there's an obstacle to you fulfilling the vision but I'm here to tell you today that the obstacle or the attack is never connected to what God has already spoken but it's always connected to the victory that you can experience here on earth pastor what are you trying to tell me I'm trying to tell you that anything God has spoken over your life it shall come to pass the problem 
problem is I can miss certain victory that he has designed for me on earth. Pastor, you got to give me that in the scripture. Thank you. I will. There was a victory God promised to Moses and to the children of Israel that they were going to live in a promised land. But because of their own disbelief and their own doubt and their own frustration, what could have happened for them in 11 days, it took 40 years and all of them missed the victory that was promised to them. Pastor, what are you trying to tell me? We cannot allow the attack to ever get past our vision and rob my victory. I don't mind if you attack my vision. You can talk about me all you want. As long as I don't let you steal my victory, everything is all right. How do I let something that was designed just to be an attack on my vision creep its way into my victory? When I start declaring that I've lost, what I've done is I've told that thing that it went beyond vision and got to my victory. I've got to learn that there's power in my mouth that when I declare a thing, it shall be established unto me. I don't care how far-fetched it seems. I don't care how crazy it might look. I'm wild enough to believe that whatsoever I ask him according to his will, he shall do that thing. So when I begin to speak about my son, and when I begin to speak about our school, and when I begin to speak about our I don't care what devil in hell ever decides to talk about my vision. He'll never be able to steal my victory. Because I'm going to talk about the third until I'm rocking the third in my arms. I'm going to talk about the third until he's standing up here beside me and we're preaching this gospel together. I believe that victory is still mine. I don't care what you say about my vision. You'll never steal my victory. And the Bible says that when Joseph heard this blessing, Evangelist Graham, he began to get excited. And he began to be thankful. So much so, here's how you know that in the 50th chapter of Genesis, when his father dies, his brothers, his haters, the one who tried to attack his victory, his brothers come running to him and they begin to lie to him. And they said, listen, daddy left command that when he died, you're still supposed to forgive us and take care of us. Joseph said, you missing it, man. I let y'all attack my vision, but you'll never attack my victory. He says, y'all come on, live with me. I'll take real good care of you because I understand victory is something you cannot steal from me. You might have messed with my vision for the last 13 years. You might have messed with my vision while you got here. You might have talked funny about me. You would have said all kind of crazy things, but the God that I serve has given me victory now. And because can't even bother me the way they do. I look my abuser in the eye. I look my evil friend in the eye. I look my backstabber in the eye. And I tell them I can still love you because you tried to steal my victory, but God made you stop at my vision. Oh, I gotta keep going here. After I identify Mr. Black, uh, the witness in uh, behind uh, a ballot, that thing which I see, and I begin after that to recognize the attack is beyond my vision, but it is on my victory. The last thing, the last point I want to give you, and I'm getting ready to get out of here, is that I've got to understand the weight of my crown. Uh, I got to understand the weight of my crown. The, the, the word, the word, the word glory, uh, like we saw in our original text today out of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verse number 17. Uh, he says, for our light affliction, the stuff that we're going through is really light. It only lasts for a moment, but it works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That word glory there lends us to the Greek word doxa, which speaks of there being an honor and a splendor uh, that is bestowed upon us. But another synonym for the word glory as it relates to that particular verse is the word Stephanos. Stephanos is the Greek word that we find for a crown. A crown, catch this minister black, is the emblem of royal dignity. Uh, the crown is the emblem of royal dignity. It is a symbol of of reward, a symbol of reward. And the final thing that the crown, the Stephanos is, it is a prize that is conferred on a victor in a public game or challenge. A prize that is conferred 
upon a victor in a public game or challenge. Pastor says that in order to fight that thing I cannot see, that thing that I was not necessarily prepared for in advance, I've got to understand the weight of my crown. Now, 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 Paul tells us that there is a crown of glory that we receive by going through our light affliction. He says that the affliction, Deacon Wells, actually serves a purpose in that the affliction is actually working for you. Okay, uh, the challenge that you're facing today, whether it be physical, spiritual, relational, financial, emotional, mental, or whatever, that particular challenge is actually working to prepare you to carry the weight of your crown. Yes. Okay, uh, when babies are born, uh, when they're born, you got to be very delicate with them when you handle them because their necks, Sister Coot, are not yet strong enough to support their head. Because their necks are not yet strong enough to support their head, uh, it has taught us that when I'm holding the baby, I've got to make sure that I'm keeping the part of his weakness supported because he doesn't have enough strength yet uh, to hold his own weight. And what you find is that some babies, after you know a couple of months, they, they got enough strength in their neck that they can hold their heads. Or some babies whose heads may be a little larger, y'all catch that next week, uh, it takes about six or seven months for them to really be able to balance the weight of their head. But every time uh, that they're growing and every day that's progressing, even though some of them are going through cranky spells and, and going through frustration and not being able to do certain things, all of that is simply working to make their neck strong enough to support their head. And I said, God, why are you talking to me about a baby being able to support his own head? He says, Son, because many of us in the body of Christ still look like that baby. Many of us are still not in a place that we can hold our own head up. And if I can't hold my head up, how can I hold a crown? So God says you've got to first help them understand, son, that their battle is designed, and catch this, to try to push their head down so that they can have enough opposition to fight against in holding their head up. And so I begin to say, Lord, help me with that. He says, that's why when the affliction comes as a type of a weight, it's coming normally from the top down. Pastor, what are you telling me? Normally my battle starts in my mind because whatever goes on up here is going to control what the rest of me does. So if I begin to think a person is against me, even if they're really not, my mind has already told me that they are, so my body is going to respond accordingly. Many times in your own marriage, help me today, Jesus, you're finding yourself going through invisible battles based on some foolishness that has crept into your mind. You've created a scene about what the house is going to look like before you get there and because you allow your mind to tell you that your body comes in defensive. You come in already ready to snap on somebody. You come in already with an attitude. Why? Because it started in your mind and when the person tries to tell you it's not really like that. Look at what's going on around me. It's hard to get that message translated from your lips back to my mind because that's the source of where the battle starts. And God says, Hinton, when they can begin to learn how to hold up their own head when they're going through their difficulties, that's a sign that they're ready to carry the weight of their crown. Pastor, what do you mean by holding my own head? That means that when things tell me to walk with my head hung down, I've got to look those things in the face and say, I'm going to lift up my head on these gates and even lift them up the everlasting door so that the king of glory can come in. The Bible says, who is this king of glory? He's the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Wait a minute, we're talking about battling the unseen thing today. So I begin to understand that the strength of the battle is never in me, but it's the Lord who is mighty in battle. And what he does is he fights for me long enough that my neck gets strong enough to support the weight of my crown. Here it is right here, Ma, you go like this. I begin to think as I go to my seat about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that he, in fact, uh, Deacon Wells, is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I begin to think, well, what does a king look like? A king is somebody who's wearing a crown. Well, Ma, catch this. I begin to do a little 
little digging. Help me today, Jesus. I wish I had a keyboard. I began to do a little digging. And in my digging, I began to research something because my mom likes to say this a lot and she's accurate. And I want to make sure I could back up what she says in the scripture. Many times when people leave, when people die, the Bible people begin to say, you know, this person is now, you know, in the presence of the Lord. And they are to a degree. But my mom likes to say this. Uh, even though they're in his presence, they cannot crown him until I get there. And I begin to think about what the crown of the king must look like. And the Bible shows me in Revelation where it is that John gets a sneak peek into what Jesus looks like. The Bible says that when he lays eyes on Jesus, it makes no mention of him having a crown. But it is not until the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation that we see Jesus now wearing a crown. Pastor, where are you, where are you taking me? What are you trying to tell me? Well, the construct of the book of Revelation is designed that the first three chapters are what we, even as the people of God, will experience. But it's chapters 4 through 19 that tell about what will happen during the, the time of, of, of tribulation, the time that we're going to miss out on. But the Bible says, Mr. Black, that in the 14th verse of the 14th chapter, in the 13th verse, he says, and the dead in Christ, they in fact will no longer, they will now be at rest from their labor. What 1413 teaches me is this is the time that all of us who have been alive and have been remained and caught up to meet with him have now seen Jesus for who he is. And the 14th verse says, and he was crowned with majesty and with power. Pastor, what are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to tell you this, that even Jesus, please hear me, has not yet received the crown that he worked for. So what does that tell me? That tells me that the work I'm putting in on earth is not for a crown that I'm going to wear down here, but it's a crown that I'm getting set up for in the by and by. So what I'm trying to tell you is there will be an eternal struggle. There will be a struggle that as long as there's breath in your body, but every day you remind yourself, I'm only going through this to carry the weight of the crown that's laid up for me. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but to all them also who love his appearance. Jesus, there's a crown that's waiting for me. I've got to be willing to go through while I'm down here on earth. Come what may, go who may. I've got to be willing to fight to know that there's a crown that's waiting for me. He told me I've got to learn how to get my spiritual muscles up so that when I change from this carnal man into a, a perfect man, I'll then be able to carry in my life, the weight of the crown that I've been working on down here on earth. So no matter what I go through, no matter how hard it gets, I know that my press is for a crown that's waiting on me in glory. I wish somebody here would be thankful to God to know that there's a crown that's waiting for you. If you can but just hold on, don't give up, don't quit, don't throw in the towel because there's a weight of glory that belongs to you. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus. Thank you, Pastor Hinton, and thank you all for viewing and sharing this video. Stay tuned and in tune for the next awesome move of God.